the light. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for sticking with us for this last panel of the conference. I'm so happy to see so many faces, to see so many familiar faces, to see people representing uh, familiar organizations uh, from me. Um, I'm from EVPA. EVPA is a European organization for investors for impact. Um, 300 members based in Brussels. Um, so happy to be here. Myself, I'm more or less an entrepreneur turned business angel turned impact investor turned uh, fund manager um, and now ended up with EVPA where I run the Impact Funds Initiative. Um, I can talk for this, uh, about this for a long time, but I won't uh, because we have a, a fabulous panel today with me. I'm, I'm honored to host this panel. Um, so I'd like to kick it off with a, with a brief introduction by every one of us. And I'll just go start on my left-hand side and we'll go like this. Thank you, Martijn. My name is Gunnar, Gunnar Stork. I have been with DEG, the German Development Bank for the private sector, for the last 20 plus years, um, which is quite some time, in various positions, and today heading one of the three industry sectors we are, we are working on. Super. I think we should keep it short, right? Good idea. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Luther Brian Carter, um, uh, uh, head the emerging market bond team at HSBC Asset Management. I joined two years ago um, to spearhead the launch of our Article 9 fund suite in emerging market debt. So we launched the world's first EM corporate green bond called Regio in uh, two years ago. Uh, and on the back of that success, we're now launching two further Article 9 EMD funds, uh, a labeled bond fund that goes beyond green. Uh, to all kinds of impact bonds, and a sustainable bond fund focused on investing in non-labeled bonds at early stages of ESG transformation. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me here. I'm Shomendra Ghosh. I'm from Vivriti, India. Uh, we have two businesses. We have a $650 million uh, asset book, which is deployed across over 225 enterprises, small enterprises, which lack access to debt markets. Uh, we also have an uh, online enterprise debt marketplace uh, that has mobilized approximately $11 billion since inception. That's over the last half a decade. Uh, pleasure being here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa Wardans. I'm Spanish. I'm one of the founding partners of Oryx Impact. Oryx Impact is a gender lens fund of fund investing in African impact funds along three impact verticals, which are job creation and economic development, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and gender equality. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, the title of today, if you've seen it, is um, A Spotlight on Emerging Markets, A Deep Dive on Blended Finance and Tackling Inequalities, which is kind of a, a broad theme to tackle. Um, and therefore, I'm also so happy that we have a team, uh, a panel here on stage that can kind of catch that thematic in this big, uh, in the broadness of the full team. Um, the thing is we need to keep it to 45 minutes. Um, so what I did is kind of cut it up in three uh, themes that you can see in the title, which is, of course, the emerging markets, and then secondly, the blended finance, and then thirdly, how does this actually tackle inequalities? Um, I'd like to start with, with, the emerging, with the emerging markets and with my, with my first question. Um, what do you consider to be um, the specific gap or the specific challenges that are related to, um, um, to these emerging markets? Um, Sumendra, you talked about three drivers before in the conversation that we have to, had to prepare this. Could you, could you elaborate on this, please? Surely, Martin, and uh, while what I'll talk about ref talks about India, but then it's quite applicable to several other large emerging markets which are equally populated. Uh, to keep it simple, there are broadly three drivers to our mind uh, where, which warrants intervention through blended finance. Number one, when you look at the outcome gaps, developmental outcome gaps, the gaps are massive. Uh, you talk of clean energy installations and actual generation gap is massive. Uh, you talk of mobility solutions, you talk of healthcare measured as uh, number of beds per population or affordable healthcare gap is massive. Food wastage, 
uh, warehouses, gap is massive, uh, access to finance for women entrepreneurs and small enterprises, all of these are very, very large outcome gaps, right? This is the first driver. To my mind, the second driver is that who does these businesses, right? I mean, who's involved in this? And this is where a uh, bit of an insider view, because I'm sure everyone here in this room will have India on your radar and maybe on your portfolio as well. But then, fact of the matter is, this, this, this country has roughly 28,000 businesses, enterprises, which aim to borrow and grow and do businesses like these. They are in all of these sectors that I mentioned, right? 28,000. Uh, and the third driver is that the state of capital markets, local markets as it stands today, is very far from addressing the needs of these businesses and then helping them meet those outcomes that we talked about uh, in the beginning. Right? To give you some sense of how skewed this is, in shallow debt markets of India, which is roughly uh, a $500 billion corporate debt market, 90% of these markets are cornered by about 50 companies in a country with 28,000 companies. So that's, that's the kind of uh, skew that exists, and as a result, we see, and we, we've been pushing for the role of blended finance in not just uh, driving outcomes of where the money goes, but necessarily fueling local market development. We have to get the the money that's in the country, which is with institutions and private capital, back into the economy. And to our mind, finance has a big role uh, in that process. Great. Thank you, Shumendra. I, th I think it was you, Gunnar, that at the same preparational call mentioned that, that part of the reasons that these gaps are still in place was also the risk perception uh, of these markets. Could you, uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. And, um and, and picking up on your last words, like shallow debt markets in, in India. Now, first of all, which markets are we talking about? What are emerging markets? I guess if, if we ask the question to the audience, everybody has different markets in mind. You could start with what was originally the, the brick markets, then you could start or you could continue with the next 11, they were called, the Mexicos, Indonesians, et cetera. And then you have the other LDCs. So, so, so what are we really talking about? Probably in the, in the, in the top five of them, um, you have enough data, enough transparency to invest there. So, so everybody here in the room would probably say, I pretty much know what I get in, in India or in, or in Brazil. Um, but what about Nicaragua? What about uh, Bangladesh? What about Nigeria? Uh, I, I, I guess, again, same question here to the audience. Many people may say, you know what, in investing money in these countries, are you, are you nuts? Why, why should I do that? And, and that's what I meant when I, when I was talking about perceived risk. I mean, we're a development bank, so it's a bit easy to talk. We, we're active in 90 countries in, in, these, um, in, in all these markets. Um, and what we feel is that whenever the, the risk, the, the, the de facto risk, the real risk in Europe or, or North America may be here, then the de facto risk in these markets may be, it's a bit higher, yes. But the perception and also what you all have on your tables in terms of, in terms of ratings is probably somewhere here. And, and this is something you can arbitrate with. You, you, can, you can benefit from, from those perceptions because you actually get a price for a product, be it debt or equity or bonds or whatever, that's, that's really there where the perception is because the, the, there's not that much of a finance offer in these markets. So that's, that's why the prices are higher. But if you then know your way and, and, and know your business in these, in these single markets, in these single countries, and you know how to manage the, the risk, which is not that much higher, but only that much higher, then you can really benefit, also financially speaking, um, from, from, this, from this concept. And, and that, that is our, call it also our mission as a development bank, to, to convince the world that this is, that this is possible, that, that, a, uh, that you can make nice commercial returns in those markets in order to attract more money into these markets and create more impact. Great. Thank you very much. Well, moving over to Brian, you're not representing a development bank, but really a bank, and still you're active in emerging markets. So, so how, how do you deal with these risks? And also, moving a bit to the second topic in the title, how can, how can blended finance play a role in, 
in, in yeah, lowering these risks. Well, the world has changed so rapidly in the last couple of years. Um, I think two years ago, people were still looking at emerging markets and asking, is this sustainable? And then, as Gunnar talked about, those would be the questions that uh, investors would often ask, is this too much risk? Uh, the world's changed so rapidly that I think people now look at emerging markets, assume it's sustainable, and ask the question, is this greenwashing? And that's the first place we go, I think, when we think about risk or risk perception, especially in public funds. Uh, so as an extremely conservative bank, uh, the, certainly the most conservative organization I've ever worked for, HSBC Asset Management lives in constant fear of any uh, perception of facilitating degradation of sustainability standards in the market or being accused of enabling greenwashing. And that's our guiding principle. That's really the compass that we use in everything we do now. So we have so many layers that ensure that our portfolios are guarded against greenwashing risk. Uh, it starts with screening at the fundamental analyst level. We have 47 global credit analysts and a team of dedicated sovereign analysts that first and foremost use active proprietary research uh, to ensure that all of the investments we're taking from the first principles uh, basis, from the bottom up, is truly um, a genuine and authentic sustainable investment. So there we use sustainability assessments, which are like checklists, highly administrative, but we also use uh, green bond assessments and other labeled bond standards, and we have a much higher set of standards internally than the marketplace does, certainly much higher than ICMA or CBI do for these kinds of impact bonds. Uh, we're excluding things based on activities, impact reporting, project lists, use of proceeds, tied proceeds. Uh, the failure rate is quite high for investments that others might think are green, but we disqualify. And then we now have in place a very robust internal Article 9 screening, which goes even further. So at the end of the day, we're only um, able to invest in about 10% of the covered securities that we, that, we, that we actually research for our Article 9 funds. Secondly, the governance is extremely robust for a large, open, listed public organization these days. So for our Article 9 funds, as an example, not only do we have an ESG investment committee for the EMD, investments for the emerging market investments that I chair, but above me there's an oversight committee that's governed by the responsible investment team, and then above that there's an oversight committee that has the global heads of uh, investments and risk. So we have a committee structure uh, where we can escalate any controversies or reputational risks that we're concerned about um, before they become an issue. But lastly and most importantly, it's the engagement that we do, again back to the analyst level, uh, by using fundamental research, we're able to deeply embed all of the, again, intuition of sustainability from the first principles so that our internal research on the companies that we buy and as well as the sovereigns we buy are really living impact reports. We don't have to go back a year later and write something. We're, we're building that text and updating that text on a, on a live basis. And we use our stewardship team uh, to design our engagement strategies whenever we need help. Uh, achieving the kinds of outcomes or breaking through um, paralysis in, our, in engagement or, or the inability to get through to issuers so, uh, so that our engagement never stops being effective. So those are the three layers that we use, I think, to address our risks internally. How does blended finance play a role? Well, it gives us the scale in our funds in order to be sure that we can maximize the catalytic role that our Article 9 investments have because we not only want to um, enable change at the issuer level, but we want to change the standards in the market through what we're doing. And we want to bring more finance to um, impact investments generally. So that gives us the scale. It gives us the backing and the credibility so that we feel like we are empowered to be loud and be vocal when we interact with companies, especially where we have uh, controversies or, or a difference of opinion. But I think most importantly, the the official sector, when uh, co-investing with the private sector, uh, provide a seal of approval. And, and that's really maybe the most important element of this. Because there is no market standard seal of approval for sustainable investments. So to say that you have a fund that's backed by the official sector or that has multilateral development co-investors is, is just about as good as a seal of approval as you can provide. So that, again, the issuers pay attention and the investors can have confidence in the end product. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, Teresa, I'm so, I'm so happy that you, that you joined 
today this 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 panel as well because I think your your approach to the topic is 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 a bit is a bit different as well. Working Quite. with yes. early stage <laughs> fund managers in Africa, you're 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 taking an extra risk in instead of preventing uh, 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 taking that extra risk. Um, if you talk about blended finance, or at least in the preparation, if you talk about blended finance, you also talk about diversifying your portfolio. Can you can you elaborate a bit on that and how that works in your context? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the role of blended finance is um, also to attract private capital, is to give comfort to private capital to go into emerging markets. Um, and I think it's very useful. Um, something that we think is also attractive um, to private investors, as Kuna was saying, is knowing where you're investing, going with accredited partners, going with people who know what's happening with local players who know where to invest, how to move, how to do things in the continent. Um, quite often the notion of impact investing in the African continent um, is people think microfinance, but there's so much more than one can do in different asset classes, in different sectors, in different geographies. That's why we think a risk mitigant is investing in a diversified portfolio as well of fund managers, of impact fund managers. Um, we have been talking and analyzing with over 200 fund managers in the African continent over the last two years in private equity, in private debt, in venture capital. And um, what we have discovered is there is incredible talent, local teams, um, international teams with very strong local presence, and talent is universal, but opportunities are not. And we're there to create opportunities for those managers and for those economies to make them more resilient and diminish the inequalities that we will come on later. So we think a diversified portfolio of impact for managers allows for a diversity of, rec of sectors. You know, we're seeing things super interesting in terms of health, in terms of education, financial inclusion, clean energy, ICT of things, um, food and agriculture, um, you know, mobility, logistics, um, diversifying across impact classes, private equity, private debt, venture capital, also allows for scalability of impact and different degrees of impact that one can achieve with one's portfolio. And diversifying across geographies also minimizes risk. Um, another thing that we're doing to minimize risk or to de-risk the portfolio is alongside our fund, we're launching a technical assistance facility to help those emerging managers, which are really relevant because they are very, very impactful with their ESG and IMM practices. Because, you know, this whole debate that we have about ESG and impact measurement and management, when you're a small team, it's really difficult to comply. You may have intentionality, but you don't have the resources to really go deep down and seriously demonstrate that, that you're doing the things right. It's not just about measuring, it's about implementing. It's about delivering. And, and, and that's what we set out to do at Oryx Impact. Thank, thank you very, thank you very much. And then I, I think the the big, the big last question or the big last topic in the uh, in the title is actually how how can how can this work? How can uh, all these activities, this blended finance, uh, uh, these trying to solve the gaps in in in, in emerging markets, how how do they actually help uh, to reduce uh, uh, to reduce these inequalities in this uh, in this world? And um, 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 and I think because because the panelists are from such different uh, different backgrounds, representing such different uh, associations, I'm really looking forward to uh, to all the answers uh, on this. I'd like to start uh, with you, actually, uh, Brian. Uh, um, how does how does your work in emerging markets help to reduce um, inequalities um, in these markets? Well, um, I'm, I'm very aware there's going to be an answer very different probably from my other panelists, but um, to give you a sense, because we come from such a macro perspective, my pet peeve is the ESG data, I think, are, are feeding inequalities. And, and the clearest example of this is um, in a study that the World Bank published last year showing that ESG ratings from the major ESG ratings agencies, I won't name them, I think you know who they are, are very highly correlated with GDP per capita, with income per capita. So 
uh, across the data providers, it means that if you're just doing sort of basic ESG integration using ESG data, uh, you are systematically entrenching the practice of taking money from poor countries and reallocating it to rich countries. And this is exactly the opposite uh, I don't think I need to say this, but maybe I do, exactly the opposite of what those of us who went into development finance set out to do. So this is not okay, and, and I don't uh, like to engage in debates about uh, perhaps trying to justify it. So uh, I think uh, you need to be aware of that if you're using ESG data or data providers. So most fund managers do. Uh, and if you are, if you do insist on using such data, you should control for the inequality that's embedded um, in, the, in these data but even better go away from the data. And I think we're, uh, in some ways, we're going back to the future in terms of how we do ESG integration. 20 years ago, or, or even 10 years ago, it was very fundamental. It was about um, uh, assessing the governance of companies, assessing the governance of, of issuers, and the sustainability of their policy set, and it was all very qualitative and fundamental. And then we swung to this quantitative direction where we all got married to the data uh, and, and, and now I think we're going back to first principles and, and engagement is a buzzword. We're, we've heard it in every panel in this conference. Um, so engaging with companies, engaging with issuers and doing that in a qualitative way is a better way to orientate your, your views on sustainability than uh, relying blindly on third party da uh, data providers. Uh, again, for a fund company like ours that prides ourselves on being active managers, I also think there's an important message to, to give investors that if you're paying us active fees for active management, that also means active ESG, fundamental proprietary active ESG. We're not gonna turn around and then outsource that very important work to some third party data provider. We'll do it ourselves. Uh, so I, I think that's probably my take on inequalities from a very high level. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's actually quite quite a statement that that ESG is actually feeding inequality. I, I was I was I was I was listening. I was like, am I hearing this right? But the way you put it, it 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 somewhere makes sense as well. But I I'm not an expert on ESG. Um, um, so 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 handing over this to Sumandra for the for the same question. C could you could you could you react on that uh, on that topic as well, or how do you work with ESG and how do you see uh, uh, see this? Surely, Martin. So I'm going to take an example, I'll flesh it out with how we have uh, implemented blended finance and how we measure outcomes of blended finance. Uh, uh, simple, so two levels really. One is that where is the money going? Uh, our ability to put our finger on outcomes and say that is it creating those beds? Is it enabling finance for those entrepreneurs, or is it creating those warehouses and so on, right? So that's one kind of measurement, uh, which is the tougher one, I'll say, because that's where we need data from underlying, we need to verify, we need to be able to report right, and, and keeping in mind all the hazards that uh, Brian talked about. To our mind, the lure of being able to access capital markets is a massive incentive for smaller businesses to agree to report beyond what the local lending community wants them to. And when we are trying to change behavior in extremes as these, we will need to give them those incentives. That if they report, if, if we are able to uh, take all of this data, aggregate, and able to showcase the outcome of, uh, of the money that's been given, that's going to have a multi, multi a, 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 a cascading effect on enterprises like themselves. So, so that's the tougher part of how do we report and how do we, how do we collect and how do we report data uh, from enterprises that we are financing. We don't stop there. We, we never stop there. Uh, as I said, we as a firm are, are convinced that the role of blended finance has to go further than that and catalyze capital from many other sources which will then set in motion uh, a symbiotic cycle that the country's money does get pumped back into the economy properly. So which means that the second part of it is where we measure how much have we been able to mobilize with uh, not concessionary capital, but risk-taking capital. Uh, fleshing this out with an example today, we have examples of layered funds which aggregate assets. Assets are, these are debt investments out to 
many, many such enterprises doing good work where we are able to uh, give them the, uh, we are able to give them alternate financing to what local markets and bilateral markets are bringing to them. Uh, and on the capital structure, thanks to more risk-taking capital agreeing to, to take higher risk, subordinated positions, and also higher returns with very clear outcomes on impact, uh, we are able to invite insurance capital, pension money, uh, treasury money at the senior tranches, which means that we were pulling in capital for end users which would have otherwise never come into these markets. Right? So that's how, we, we, that's how uh, we see blended finance in action. It's already in action. Uh, to your point of uh, ESG just iterating that the genuineness of this data and our ability to change behavior and incentivize people and businesses to be reporting this data is almost directly proportional to what's in it for them, freely speaking, which means that they need to see that this will work. So Great. that's a two pens. Thank you so much, Mandra. Um, Teresa, how does your work help to reduce inequalities and how does it work in practice? Yeah. Um, our work, how does it work to reduce inequalities in the African continent? We have three impact verticals in which we invest, and I will briefly, don't worry, explain how it does reduce inequalities in each one of the three different verticals. By nature of being a curated portfolio of funds, of being a fund of funds, it allows us to include smaller fund managers as well that would find it very difficult to have access to capital, to have access to private capital. And um, it allows us as well to include many female fund, many female led fund managers, because female-led fund managers are normally smaller in size in the continent. And um, we're very proud to say that 51% of our model portfolio is led by female teams, all of them 2x compliant. So in a sense, our technical assistance facility allows us um, to have those sort of emerging smaller fund managers, and that allows us for scalability of impact and for capillarity of impact. Why? Because the smaller fund managers invest in smaller SMEs, and by that we have a reach to a smaller SME base as well, and the more established fund managers target larger SMEs. So there is this cross-fertilization across all the different funds that we have in our portfolio. For us, collaborating and contributing to the local impact investment ecosystem is really important, working with local partners, working with local fund managers, working with local investors as well. It's really relevant because all of the actors of the local impact investing ecosystem are necessary for that. Um, on our three impact verticals, gender, I hope, Peter, that the survey today about diversity, it comes like a total yes uh, to your question. Um, your question of yesterday of what the priorities were and climate was at the top. Um, with regards to climate, why are we doing climate change mitigation and adaptation on the African continent? Um, the OECD is estimating that Africa will have 105 million migrants due to climate reasons alone by year 2050. Um, the whole climate crisis has really not been brought up by um, African citizens nor by African inhabitants, but they are the major sufferers of the planet of it. It is imperative to invest in climate solutions for the African continent. Climate mitigation is a global problem. Climate adaptation requires of local solutions. So it is, we've seen today as well how women are the worst affected by climate change as well. So investing in gender and investing in climate is imperative. And the great challenges, but the great opportunities. You know, investing in clean energy, the African continent, does not only contribute to environmental impact, it does in involve societal impact as well. Why? Because half of the continent doesn't have access to stable energy and stable electricity. And because it allows children to go to school, it allows for medical services, it allows for food storage and sanitation. You know, the impact, one euro, one dollar invested in a developing market has such a much further reach than it has in developed markets. Um, investing in job creation and economic stability is also key. Why? 
Africa is the fastest growing continent in population terms. It's right now 1.3 million inhabitants. It's expected to double by 2050 and to multiply by four by 2100. To give you an idea, in Europe right now, we're 750 million inhabitants. We're expected to be 630 million by 2100. We're diminishing and they're growing exponentially. The average age of the African citizen is 19.7 years of age. Of the European, is 43 years. The American is 35 years. So we have a really fast-growing population, very young. 900 million people will enter the workforce by the year 2035. It really is imperative to invest in solutions there. Great challenges, but also great opportunities. And it is about investing, it's not about aid, it's about dignity. Everybody has a right to have a proper job and to sustain their families and to decide where they want to live. And also, technology in the continent, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it is fundamental. It really allows for scalability of impact solutions. And it allows to leapfrog, and it allows to avoid mistakes we have made in our continents as well. They need our money, but they need as well tech transfer, and they need as well um, technical assistance facilities to help in other matters. But the talent is there. The intentionality for impact is there. And the illusion and excitement to do things for their own continent is also there. Great. Thank you, Teresa. And, and, and shortly before we move to, to Gunnar and, and maybe to the room, maybe we also have time for one question left as we are going in, uh, in a good pace right now. But I, I, to, to, I guess the impact that you will be measuring within the fund will be it won't, it won't be ESG, probably, or is it? Or how, how do yes. you look at these? I mean, uh, what we, is the you know, evaluation as, that you as we use? were saying, you know, for those fund managers, for us, we are investing in fund managers because of the scalability that that means and the professionalization of investment and the reachability they have to get to more SMEs. And that's why we consider that is really important. But um, with regards to us, we measure at SME level, and at fund level, and then we aggregate it. We follow the IMP standards as well. The SDGs, we use SDG metrics, Iris Plus metrics, you know, the IFC operating principles. And we want to provide those fund managers with these tools as well to be able to be into the system, to be able to attract your capital, you know, to be able to attract more private capital and to grow the market, you know, to make investing in Africa an interesting opportunity, because it really is. And as Gunnar was saying, you know, there's this perceived risk that there's very little that is very dangerous. But, you know, we can do things, and we can do things together. And we can really channel um, lots of exciting opportunities for everyone in the continent. And we really need to, because the challenges are really massive. Thank you. Thank you. Gunnar, sorry for keep you waiting a few more minutes, but um, um, before moving over to you and, and actually <coughs> asking you the same questions as, as to all the panelists, in the, in the session you also so mentioned something about um, stimulating the impact in the investments that you do as well, instead of just scouting for impact. So mm -hmm. without wanting to kind of put an answer in your mouth, it would be nice to elaborate a bit on that as well, if you... Yep, perfect. L let me combine the two, if I, Good. If I may. So Please, yeah, up to you. So first of all, which inequalities, and then how to measure, and, and then over to you, the call it stimulating, if you want. Um, so which inequalities are we, are we talking about? Now, obviously, the basic needs of people are, are the same everywhere across the globe, um, just that in our markets, they are massively bigger, and the inequalities are massively bigger. So, so what did we do or what do we do in order to, to, to tackle uh, those? We, we divided our, uh, our activities into three groups. Uh, one is focusing on financial sector. So inequality being financial inclusion, access to finance, SME financing, so very small companies which just from, from Germany we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't get access to. That's group number one. Group number two would be infrastructure, which are very basic needs. You, you mentioned energy. Right, obvious, but also water, waste, um, and then also also logistical topics. Um, so everything related around infrastructure. 
And the third group is what we call industries and services. So these are really the, the basic needs of people, um, like food, food security, uh, healthcare, education, um, low-income housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so there are various topics you need to address in those markets, and, and that's how we how we split our work in the institution. Now, what are the effects of that of that work of that financing? Um, First of all, one has to understand our, our work is direct and private. So apart from the 20% we're doing through funds, the rest is, is a direct lending or direct equity into companies or projects. So the, the, the data collection works directly with the companies. So, so we don't have any other service providers. Uh, we collect the data on jobs, on decent jobs, on, on greenhouse gases, on local income, on exports, on hard, in, on, on hard income, on hard currency income, on gender, etc., etc., etc. So it's a system of, 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 a, of, a, of a various points which we put together to a rating, a development effectiveness rating. Um, that's an in-house thing, um, but which we also gave to, to other institutions, so, so it's I, I wouldn't call it standard, that's too much, but um, um, we're, we're, we're trying to, um, to, to, to make it visible to the world. And that brings me to, to your point now. We're not only trying to, to, to make it visible or known to investors or lenders, um, because everybody, we, we talk a lot about measurement these, uh, the, these days here. Um, everybody's looking for the same data and for, for transparency. But we're also just starting to make it visible and usable for our clients. So, so they, they receive a, a, a sheet, an analysis, of which we believe that can be used for their advertising, for their, for their marketing, for, for their campaign to say to the outside world, listen guys, the typical agribusiness company worldwide in DG, DG's portfolio scores X, and we score X plus one. So that should hopefully help them to, to attract more, well, more and more, more visibility in the outside world. Ideally, future financing, because everybody looks for the same data. And, um, and this is one, well, intent to make that a bit more visible and, and touchable. And then, well, just again, to attract more money. Great. Thank you very much. With that, um, I'm out of my questions. Um, so I'm going to put these back in my pocket. Um, are there any questions? I, I, see a quest, I see a hand raised right in front of me. So is there anybody with a mic that can come closer so we can um, hand over to this gentleman? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, fascinating panel. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, you know, I spent a few decades almost at the IFC where uh, some of you will know the term emerging markets was coined. I didn't take responsibility for coining the term. But when I joined the IFC, <clears throat> um, Korea was an emerging market. Um, China wasn't even a market because nobody could invest in China. India wasn't even a market because outside of domestic investors, people couldn't invest in India. My question to you is hearing the panel and hearing the diversity that we have uh, in emerging markets. Um, I'm wondering, is it time to retire the term emerging markets? Because <laughs> Are we doing ourselves a disservice in the investor community when we talk about this group from China to Malawi in the same context? And I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, Gunnar, from DEG's perspective on, on down, whether it makes sense to do this, and if so, why? Thank you. Well, that, that's why I started saying what I said about what are we talking about. Are we talking BRIC, Next11, or LDCs? So, so there are... Well, many people have tried to come up with, with names for that. Uh, growth markets has been a topic, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, emerging markets doesn't, doesn't fit it correctly. As you said, China to Malawi, that, that, that's not one group of companies. Uh, well, I don't have a solution for that, um, for, for sure. Um, but in, in our papers, you would read, we are an investor in, um, in emerging markets and developing countries. Um, also not really... A, 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 a great, well, a great, great names for, for what we're doing. But um, well, I'm definitely with you that we should that we should find that we should find words better describe where we're doing business. That's definitely the case. 
and, and any, any of the other panelists have ID for a vocabulary, so we can also have a proper you know, title next, uh, next, uh, next event of Phoenix, and we're sitting in this room again. Uh. Well, I'll just defend the, the current status quo. I think that just like you know, if you talk about gender equality and you focus on women as a separate uh, class, it brings the attention to ensure that the inequality gets focused. And just like if you talk about uh, small businesses and you ensure that there's focus on small businesses as a separate set, they get the attention that they need and the microfinance that they need. So too does having emerging markets as a separate class ensure that the capital goes to emerging markets. If we folded emerging markets into global markets, it was all one set, they would be summarily neglected, ignored, underfunded, even more than they are now. So I, I, I would probably cast a vote in favor of the current framework where we consider emerging markets as a thing. Maybe it's time for China to graduate, just as Korea graduated and Singapore graduated. So yes, China maybe isn't a good comparison, but um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll support the status quo on keeping emerging markets as an asset class. I have a question on that. <laughs> if I may. Good. So, so, so do you include the Malawi and, and Nicaragua into the class of emerging markets? Yeah, in the bond universe we do. Uh, okay. There's not a, not a separation between emerging and frontier the way that equity investors have. In, in emerging market bonds we have a benchmark with I think 77, 78 countries now which okay. are just about equal in terms of country count between the um, very poor countries and the middle income countries. So it's all one set. Great, thank you. No, well, maybe it's homework for all of us. Huh? Let's come up with a different vocabulary and then, then find out whether the status quo or the... Oh, Sumandra, you have something to yeah, add to it? Just a very quick point. In principle, agree with what you're saying, that the problems we're trying to solve are different. And the relative context, clearly different problems. But people like us have the benefit and the curse of the front row seat, so we know the inequality. Uh, which is why I would... I, which is why our discourse is not so much about the fact that you've got to deploy capital, deploy capital, and find outcomes, because that's exactly what the, there are tougher countries and tougher problems which need that as a solution. Uh, the way we see it in, in markets like the ones that I was talking about, the idea is to get the cycle in motion, get the local, get the local system developed, which needs intervention, which does need external intervention. So, so the solution is different too. Uh, to that extent, in principle, agree with what you're saying. Yeah, and I think one thing, I think we're all universal investors, no? and I think what is quite relevant as well is that different outputs bring different outcomes um, in terms of um, impact that one creates, but also in terms of returns and diversification to all your portfolios um, as well. So I think continents, if you want to describe them like that, countries, emerging markets are a very necessary part of the investment portfolio as well. Thank you. I, th I think with that, unfortunately, we have come to the end of this session. Um, I think the panelists will be around. I'm sure I, I am around in, uh, during the drink. So if you have any, any more questions, don't hesitate to come up, uh, come up to us. Um, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Theresa, Sumendra, Brian, and Gunnar. Uh, for joining us today. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for sticking with us in the last panel of this, uh, of this conference at the end of the second day. And I, uh, at the end, like to thank uh, especially Phoenix for inviting us here and congratulate them in, on this already um, great conference so far. Thank you.